Okay, so we can get started. Welcome everyone. Uh, glad you could join us for um, the next session in our career conference um, uh, career conference series. Um, today we're going to be talking to some alums. Uh, the goal of this conversation is to help students um, with tips and some some advice as they navigate the uh, this um, recruiting season. Um, not just the fall, but I think you know advice that they can kind of adopt in the spring. But you know. For, it's good advice for throughout their career, especially the entry level career. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the, the, the panelists in a second to introduce themselves. But for the students, um, the format is I'll ask a few questions of the panelists. Um, but the goal is really, you know, this, the contents to be driven by you, the students. So I encourage you use the Q&A to put your questions in. We'll start to build up those questions as we go. So you don't need to wait to, as you think of a question, you can throw it into the Q&A. And then um, once I've done, once I've completed a few of these questions, then I will, uh, I'll go to those and I'll, and I'll ask those questions of the, of the panelists. Um, if you have specific panelists you do want to hear from, if you could just indicate that in the, in the question, otherwise we'll kind of throw it out to, to everyone. Um, okay, so um, let me stop sharing quickly. And um, all right, I'm just going to go kind of a circle as I see it. So I'm going to go from Nick to V to Justin, Brian, and then Connor. So Nick, if you could start, uh, share kind of who you are, who you work for, and then an interesting fun fact about yourself. Hey everyone, I'm Nick Foraker. I have been working with Deloitte for one year now. Um, I work in the cyber risk services doing consulting. And I graduated last spring from Cal with a degree in statistics. And fun facts about me, I have a pet bearded dragon named Taylor. Hi, everyone. My name is V McClure. I'm a senior recruiter at Shopify. I've been there for two and a half years. I actually am, have completed my certificate from Berkeley Extension in the software development program this year. And a fun fact about me, I am a former stunt person in the film industry before I got into tech. Justin? Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm a business operations and strategy associate at uh, Deliver, which is a fulfillment startup. Uh, I graduated from Cal in December 2017 with a degree in IOR and a minor in stats. Um, I pursued consulting for a couple years um, across kind of supply chain and telco uh, before transitioning to deliver. Actually, Connor, uh, also on the panel, was my intro to deliver. And a fun fact about me is that I have had four different passports over the course of my life. Brian? Hey, everyone. I'm Brian. Um, I'm a software engineer that bounces around a lot of unicorns. So I've been in the startup space since graduating Cal. Um, a unicorn status company is one that's valued over uh, 1 billion, but is still yet to go public. Um, and I find it to be an exciting space. So I graduated in 2019 with a degree in computer science from Cal, May 2019. Um, I guess fun fact kind of about uh, related to like hopping around the unicorn spaces, I actually appealed to get into the CS major. So I didn't get in the first time. Um, and I appealed and then later got in and went on to ran a club at Cal and teach CS370. So never give up. Thanks, Brian. Connor? Yeah, and I'll wrap things up. Uh, I'm Connor Golstad. I'm on the data science team at Deliver, chiefly working on margins optimization. Uh, graduated from Berkeley in May 2017, uh, studied economics and public policy with a focus in microeconomic theory and econometrics. Um, and fun fact about me, uh, well, I'll actually give two because I, I just realized this is probably the first time I've worn a collared shirt in probably the past year because uh, we don't wear them at Deliver either, let alone during a pandemic. But uh, my other fun fact is that I love playing board games uh, uh, with my friends, but obviously hard to do that in person. So I've been playing a lot of Settlers of Catan online uh, I actually spent nine euro to get a lifetime pass to KatanUniverse.com. So, best uh, nine euro I've ever spent. Um, I love these fun facts. I could we could derail this panel so easily with some questions about bearded dragons and stunts and, and passports, but uh, maybe for another time. 
Um, okay, so uh, first question I, I want to ask, and um, I think, you know, V, I'm going to send this question your way because it is around recruiting, but I, I, I'm also interested to hear the perspective of the other panelists. Um, how um, have or will your company's hiring practices changed due to the current uh, economic crisis and COVID-19 pandemic? So V, we'll start with you. Sure. So first off, I can tell you that Shopify is in the online commerce space, um, commerce in general, but specifically e-commerce. And so we've been really, really lucky in that the pandemic has, for lack of a better term, helped our business versus hurt. Um, we do know that obviously a lot of companies aren't in the same boat. Um, so our hiring practices have actually um, changed in more of the remote way versus the volume uh, way. So uh, we've actually um, announced that we are fully remote. So as of June, uh, Shopify is a completely remote company and will continue to do so. So um, it's actually opened up a lot of opportunities for uh, applicants and also recruiters because I no longer have to ask people if they want to relocate to Canada to work at Shopify, which is, makes my life a little easier. Um, and so Shopify is now opening its doors and its teams to being in different locations. So this idea that I have to stay in the Bay Area in order to get a job in the tech industry is very quickly no longer a rule. And so that I think is the biggest change that not only Shopify, but also a lot of other companies are, um, are now making. Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, I'd echo those sentiments um, to, you know, take that from like the descriptive to the advice side of things. Um, like we're in the same boat uh, being in e-commerce. And so our hiring is actually accelerated pretty drastically. Like when I joined about a year ago, we had about 40 uh, full-time employees. And I think pre-COVID in March, it was somewhere around, you know, 60 or so. We're about 120 now. So you basically can't hire quickly enough. And so like my point there is that uh, you know, obviously, you know, it's you know, unfortunate to be entering the labor market during a recession, but, you know, that's, that's the hand you're dealt. So you got to play it as best as you can. And so I think a key thing to look for there is companies that are counter cyclical to recessions and or pandemics, right? Uh, because every company is still going to be hiring. Um, but, you know, if you're a company that's, uh, you know, making cutbacks due to, economic downturns, you might have less available positions. Uh, whereas if you're applying to, uh, you know, companies that are, you know, e-commerce or used cars, you know, whatever all these like counter cyclical areas are, they're actually going to be, uh, you know, trying to hire more quickly. And I think you'll find a, a higher rate of success there. Uh, Mike, would this also be appropriate to kind of talk about stuff for preparing for interviewing in this environment or Later. Um, I mean, I had that question for later, kind of to really talk about that. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of just riff a little bit off what you both were saying about the growth in e-commerce, but is that sustainable? Like once, you know, once things improve in the economy and obviously, you know, when we put the pandemic, will that growth sustain itself or do you find then it'll start to shrink? Honestly, I think it's all about habits, to be totally honest with you, and how many consumers are going to change their habits during the pandemic. So, for example, I love using Instacart, and I don't like going to the grocery store. I'll probably continue to do that after the pandemic anyway. Um, so I think there will be... I think there will be changes to how people behave because of this pandemic, and whether or not that uh, affects... Um, a company either negatively or not after the pandemic. I, obviously, we'll have to wait and see. But I mean, for example, um, people stopped buying books in a lot of ways. And so everybody's like, oh, no, what's going to happen to Amazon? And they then took advantage of their platform by just selling different items. And so um, I think all businesses continue to try to adapt, whether it's through a pandemic or at the end of one. So that's not something I'm overly concerned about, to be totally honest, in the e-commerce space, because it's really about more people just being comfortable online. And I don't think that's going to go away. But that's my two cents. Nick, I'd be curious to get your input on this, because, you know, startups, we generally just hire for a role we need to fill at the time. But like banking, consulting, they do the big batch kind of waves. Have you guys like changed quotas? 
Um, consulting has been a little interesting. So as you might expect with government consulting, there's actually more business with the pandemic because a lot of agencies are trying to do things that they haven't ever really had to do. Um, anything from how to award a grant based on COVID to how to change a practice to where they can actually work remotely because for the government, that's not a thing for a lot of practices, especially when they're dealing with very um, sensitive data. So me working in the cyber realm of government agencies, um, if anything, it's picked up. As far as the hiring practices, um, I don't think much has changed except that now every single interview is gonna be done remotely. Um, they're still recruiting a lot of people and now a lot of that glamour of like traveling and getting to go to all those onboarding and training things around the country is gone. But for, I don't think consulting has felt it too much. If anything, this has just proved that you don't usually have to be on a consulting site Monday through Thursday, realistically. Okay, the, the next question is, is kind of related, but just wondering about what changes in general that you've seen um, in the way that um, tech hires. Um, you know, I think obviously we've seen it's now fully virtual uh, interviewing, um, but in terms of like, how have you observed things moving? Is it like, you know, the platforms that they're using to do technical interviewing? Are they, you know, are they, are they condensing interviewing? So now you are, it's one, you know, essentially one day of like multiple interviews versus spreading it out. Have you, have you, have you either in your experience when you got your job or have, or have you seen that change? From my perspective, it's about the same so far, uh, given all of the fact, you know, with the given known of that it's all online and virtual, like for example, like the timing, the number of interviews, the structure of those interviews actually very, very similar, at least for the roles I've been a part of hiring. I find there's an opportunity to actually move more quickly, which has been really, really nice. So instead of flying someone to an onsite or making sure you can take an entire day off of school or work in order to go into the office and interview for five hours, we have the luxury of Google Hangouts or Zoom and we can break it up into a couple of days. So in, in fact, it's actually the opposite where we're now breaking it up versus we weren't before. Um, so we are moving quicker, which is really nice. But at the same time, I can tell you that there are more applicants out there. Many major companies have gone through some serious layoffs in the last couple of months. And so there are so many more applicants. We are posting roles for a couple of days now instead of a couple of weeks. And so, and I know there's a couple other questions coming up that we'll get into the specifics of that and happy to talk about it. But I will say that um, we are definitely moving a lot quicker and we have the luxury of having a lot more people to uh, not only review, but select from. And so companies are starting to be more selective because we have a bigger applicant pool. Um, yeah, that, that's a good segue into the next question, V, which is, you know, how can students help? How can they stand out when it is, when it is such a such a large applicant pool? I'll throw that question out to anyone. Brian, maybe we haven't heard from you yet. But maybe you want to share. Yeah, so I think a big thing um, in the realm of like software and tech was it used to be that companies would toss you like an engineering challenge or some project, something that you do. And I think that no longer is quite enough. Those are kind of like the minimum requirements. You uh, get your resume through, you do the project, um, you pass kind of like the uh, technical screenings um, and they're starting to look for more unique things. So um, in the realm of software, working on projects on your own time, having them published on a website like GitHub, having some form of something that people use, whether it's an application, a website, um, like a framework that actually is a platform and shows that you are engineering on your own. Um, because now just simply passing all of the like uh, kind of testing uh, systems like lead code is like the bare minimum now just because of the amount of like large companies that have released so many employees to the hiring pool. Um, so big thing that I say is like, I've, I did this at Cal is just like do research if you can work on projects if you don't have research yet. That's how you get into research and just keep working on something that is like a project that you can publish and write about somewhere. I'd say one thing that uh, I didn't realize when I was applying out of school that I now realize the importance of being on the hiring side rather than the interviewing side is like the importance of uh, two things. One, referrals um, and two, personalization. Um, on the referrals note, I was kind of naive uh, applying, you know, full time. I thought like, eh, 
you know, I, I look pretty solid on paper. Um, you know, I think my resume is decent and they'll be able to see that and they'll, uh, you know, bring me in for an interview and then it's just crickets. Right. Um, and I couldn't figure out why that was. And I think it's a few things. One, uh, you know, everyone looks good on paper, you know, everyone's able to like kind of craft their, uh, you know, resume and, uh, you know, have all these extracurriculars, uh, that kind of thing. And then two, just from a volume perspective, um, at least on our end, like I remember recently we had a position for like strategic finance and we had, you know, over 500 applications within 24 hours. And so the referral was used less as like, a, oh, here's a bonus for this candidate and more like, we're going to look at the subset of resumes that have a referral period and everything else might get disregarded. So that's something that I didn't realize was uh, that important, but you know, the good news is being at Berkeley, um, you know, you are attending one of the top schools in the world and one of the best brands in tech. And so there should be, uh, you know, people from our school, uh, our school at all these top companies. Right. And then the second thing, just quick note on personalization. Um, you know, I get, uh, you know, now you see all these LinkedIn messages like, Hey, like I find your company really interesting. I love to connect and you can tell it's just copy and paste. And that's not really like uh, intriguing or interesting or, you know, there's not actually like demonstrated intent uh, versus if someone said, Hey, like I read this article about what deliver does. And I find the fact that you're applying that like the Uber asset light, you know, model to warehouse is really interesting. I go, Oh, okay. This person's actually done their homework. They're actually interested. That would make me much more likely to engage. I'll, I'll tie that thread more explicitly. So V's point was on how much volume is in the marketplace right now. And Connor's talking about, you know, getting that intro to kind of cut through the volume. So it's even more important to do that now than normal. Um, similar issue with like position we were opening up and looking to fill uh, just a crazy volume of candidates. And even to the point that like the LinkedIn, can I chat about for 15 minutes about your company became completely untenable to respond to while it was something a year ago that I would have responded to because it was a couple messages a week versus a couple messages a day asking for 15, 30 minutes. So it's going to be harder to get that intro. It's going to be harder to get that referral, um, even if it's now more important. I think, um, also, the Career Center is your best friend. I mean, just yesterday, I did a bunch of one-on-ones with people that was coordinated by the Career Center through them. And each student was able to get 10 minutes alone with a professional, which I know is like not very common with the old model where you might go up to a booth and you have to wait through five people to talk to someone, which at that point, you're kind of wondering, what do I actually say to this person who's probably talked to 100 people? And then you maybe have like a few minutes before you're going to want to let the next person talk. So I feel like the best way to stand out now is to just continually go to as many things for the companies that you're interested in. So you can have the best chance to keep getting as many people to know your name and to recognize you. And then if you, once you make it to that round where you start getting interviewed and know, you know your name is on the list, I think from there, the best thing that you can do to stand out is to know why you want to work for that company in specifics. I think especially in consulting, everyone's going to throw their hat into the ring for KPMG, EY, PwC, Deloitte, maybe some MVBs. And I think some people do the numbers game thinking as long as I apply to a ton, one will pick me. Um, and I think it's almost better to apply for less, but also know very much why you want to work for those companies rather than just hope one of them will pick you because you're interested in that realm of work. 100%. Uh, customize your resume for every single job you apply to. Take keywords from those job descriptions and incorporate them into your resume. I, whenever I do resume consulting, I always tell people, assume that every single applicant has the base set of skills for this role. So what sets you apart? Metrics, awards, projects, ownership, anything like that that will really call out your experience and why you're the best person for this job is gonna be important. And agree with everything this panel is saying, just blasting out that you have a less than 5% chance of getting hired from a cold application. So then, how are you going to network? Do it smartly. Connor, you made a perfect point. Why, and, and Nick too, why are you applying to this job and personalizing it is going to get, out, get you above those messages that Justin referred to that you were getting, we are all getting every single day. And so working is really hard and it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And that's gonna start with the application process to be totally honest with you. And what that is demonstrating to us is I'm a hard worker I care about this job, I care about this company, 
and I'm doing it from the very beginning. And that's really what all of this work ahead of time is telling us. So it's really important. Yeah, a quick plug for um, those opportunities you talked about with, is our career fairs. So we're using the this the kind of the the virtual world uh, and taking advantage of it. We're now diversifying our career fairs. So in the past, we just we used to have some concentrated like career fairs, but now we're having specifically software engineering career fairs. We'll have data analytics, um, uh, bio. Um, next week our, is our EECS internship and our EECS career fair. So for students, just encourage you to go to Handshake, register for those, attend. Like you said, it's the way to, it's the way to kind of get, you know, match a face to a resume, which I think really helps, helps to stand out. Um, Justin, you mentioned that Connor was your connection into Deliver. Is that right? Can you, can you uh, elaborate more on how that came about? Uh, yeah. So the actual memory of it, I was in a kind of late night work session uh, on my consulting project at the time. Uh, and Connor sent me a Facebook message saying, um, hey, I've been like thinking about potential people to bring on board for this role. And actually when I thought of you, I, you know, I think it's a really good intersect of uh, your kind of like background. Um, and I actually immediately responded without clicking on the link he sent me that you're know, not really looking for anything right now. Uh, and then an uh, hour or two later, we were still working. I clicked on the link. <laughs> and after reading, reading a little more, I messaged him that we should meet up and talk about it. I wasn't super sure about kind of the fit for the exact role we were talking about, um, but at least started a conversation that ended up with me at Deliver three months after we, we first kind of started talking about it. It was kind of a slow roll, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add to that. Um, and, you know, to offer another point of advice, like Justin and I, uh, knew each other from, uh, we were both in the Berkeley group. Uh, like I, it's probably not as common on the like, college of engineering side, but it's a club that provides pro bono consulting for local nonprofits. Yeah. <laughs> Justin being a notable exception. I mean, we do have a lot of, you know, ECS, et cetera, but also a lot of, uh, you know, business econ and the like, but, uh, I, I think that's another, point where um you know as you're building your network in school like a good way to do that outside of like your class your your dorm or whatever is by joining like professionally oriented clubs i know there are a lot of you know engineering based clubs for instance and and that can help you establish connections um you know i think especially you know if you're younger like a freshman or sophomore you know you're joining now than the or even a junior the people that you're in that club with who are older than you. Um, by the time you're applying for a job, they'll be spread out at all these different companies. We'll be able to give you, you know, advice and or, and or referrals and the like. So uh, yeah, fortunately Justin's doing some pretty phenomenal work for us. So making me look good. <laughs> and really that's what the referral about is, is about. You know, companies encourage their employees to recommend, you know, refer their network and and most times there's a financial incentive there for those employees you know if somebody if somebody in the network is hired and and stays on for at least six months then that employee gets gets a, a bonus you know so there's there's a lot of they really they trust they trust their employees and they trust the employees network so it is i think the referral is a is a very strong way to to get get to kind of you know rise from the pile of resumes um I'm gonna ask one or two more questions again, just to the students, if you could start to populate. We have a couple of questions in there, but really wanna get a, a nice, healthy uh, menu of questions. So please, anything you wanna learn about um, kind of breaking into uh, internship or, or a full-time opportunity, put it into the Q&A and we'll get to it in a second. Maybe Justin, coming back to what you wanted to say earlier about how students can prepare. Um, should, we, should, we, should we go with that? Like what advice do you have for students to kind of get ready for this virtual world? Yeah, I had just kind of one in particular to bring up because we've been doing a lot of in interviewing uh, recently. Uh, and that is just kind of practicing for the remote interview. I think it's a bit of a given for students currently going into a recruiting cycle, they expect to be remote. If you're practicing with your friends, it's likely already remote. Um, but for a lot of people that are, you know, currently looking to transition into a role, they, you know, haven't had that experience. And so if you're a senior and you spent two years prepping for, you know, club interviews and then internship interviews all in person, uh, make sure you get those reps in virtually as well uh, and learning, you know, which things can cause friction virtually that you hadn't thought of. So you're not going to have that whiteboard to go to like you might normally. Uh, it's a little tricky to like show paper, maybe you get like a little scratch pad. 
whatever helps make it smoother and more streamlined for you to adapt to that virtual format and still really engage with the person. Um, it, it's worth, it's worth really getting those reps in and getting that practice. Uh, I actually got something to add to that as well. Uh, yeah. One, like big, big agree with Justin's point. Um, I, to put it in like student terms, uh, I think we've all had those midterms where, you know, you're looking at like last year's finals and midterms and it's like, oh yeah, I can do that uh, without actually doing the problems. And then you sit down to take the exam and it's just like, uh, uh oh, like, you know, you can't actually like replicate it on the exam. And so similarly, when you're preparing for an interview, uh, you know, don't just like, you know, write out like, oh, here will be my answers to different behavioral questions. Like the best way to do that is a mock interview with your friends and uh, do what Justin's saying is like actually replicate it virtually. Uh, try to make everything, you know, you try to make your practice as close to the game situation as you can, right? And so that will give you a lot more comfort and, uh, and confidence so that you're used to the actual process. And then, you know, there are uh, also like intricacies with uh, like the virtual interview. Like one thing that I've noticed in some interviews I've conducted recently is a lot of people at home, myself included, like I've got a second screen right here. And I've done interviews where uh, I ask, you know, and ask a question and the response would be just like uh, read off of this screen. Um, and, you know, that made it seem like more inorganic and like a canned answer. Um, so, you know, I would advise against, you know, just reading off something here, but I don't think it's a bad idea to have like a resume and then maybe some answers to some behavioral questions where it's not something that's scripted, but if a question is asked, you can quickly, you know, glance, it'll look like you're looking off in the distance and that will like prompt some thoughts. So, just try to like recreate that process so that when it actually comes time for the interview, uh, you don't feel like it's a new endeavor. Set up your environment as well. Uh, airplane mode is your friend uh, for your phones, watches, any devices. Um, tell your family too. Uh, I told my husband, don't come talk to me. And I put it on our calendar. I was like, I'm doing so, you know, I'm in a conference today. Um, I made sure my pets had food. So they didn't come bother me either. And I closed my door. So yeah, just make sure you set up your environment as well. And the biggest thing I tell candidates is look, everybody has tech problems, especially Google Hangouts and MacBooks sometimes don't like to get along, especially with the audio. Um, and so it's okay. Like don't get flustered. It happens all the time. It's a great test on how you just weather challenges actually. Um, so just know that it's super common. It's okay. You'll get through it and you'll be able to connect with either the recruiter or the interviewer um, and, and you can make it work. So it'll be okay. Mike, are there any resources you know of for students that maybe their like current apartment setup is, you know, a little noisy in the background for them to try and find a better place to interview or any advice for students that might have a difficult time just in their natural setup in getting that environment set up? You know, I think we would always offer, you know, the often they're like, come to the career center. We, you know, we have interview rooms where you can do that, but obviously that's the reality. You can't do that now. So it's very much kind of on, on the students, you know, on the applicants themselves to, to create that. I, I think it's key and sometimes it's underestimated just that need for a neutral kind of, um, you know, non um, distracting background. Um, you know, I think sometimes the best, way that you can control it is at home and then to use a virtual background. You know, I think if you try go somewhere, there's a lot of variables that you can't control when you, when you are leaving your home. So I would just, you know, my advice there is try set up something at, at home, like in a room, again, utilize the virtual background if you can, or if you can't, you know, just do your best to kind of, you know, do that, create that behind you. Um, but, you know, hopefully when things kind of move and we are more in person, um, just with the career center is an absolute resource for, um, to do interviews, um, even in person or remotely. I have a lot of parents interviewing from cars lately. Um, they take their phone, they download Zoom, go to their car and they're like, hey, sorry, I have a two-year-old. And it's totally fine. I mean, we are as empathetic to the situation as everybody else is. Like we're all living through this, right? And even recruiters have dealt with this as well. They have, they have kids at home or, or parents or what have you. So like if you, your family or a roommate has a car, like maybe that is a solution you can use. I can tell you that you won't be judged for it. Like this is an extenuating circumstance that we're all going through. So the recruiters will understand if you're like, hey, I'm sorry, I'm taking this from my car on my phone. 
Yeah, and if that's not an option, um, at least for me, I know that I've had to take meetings sometimes, especially for the last second. Like, I think the worst I've ever been in was taking one from the beach. Um, and <laughs> there are ways to do it. Zoom especially is great. The virtual background is good. And another thing I would say if you can invest in, especially if you know you're interviewing for like two months, like heavily, I know that Costco will sell AirPods. And I know it's not the most ethical thing, but you they do have 90 day return windows. And those a lot of those technologies with those like wireless earbuds can actually like detect when you're the one talking so i've noticed that you can be in a pretty noisy place and even though you might be concerned they won't really hear it very much or at all so i would invest in that if you know you're going to be doing tons of virtual interviews because it'll just give you a little more sanity when you're trying to go through that process Um, so I'm going to turn it over to some questions we have uh, in the Q&A. Um, any general guidelines for people in tech career transition? So maybe to kind of pitch this as, you know, students who are um, transitioning into tech, out of tech, or even within tech, um, any suggestions that you have there? Um, yeah, I can speak to this. So I was in consulting for uh, a few years out of school, uh, working with CPG manufacturers on pricing strategy. And, uh, you know, then when I was applying for startups and data science roles, uh, to, uh, to V's point, which she was talking about with, um, you know, formulating your resume to where you're applying, like, that's when I started emphasizing, like, oh, I've got, you know, background in like Python and R and SQL. And, uh, things that wouldn't be so relevant uh, where I like continuing in like a, you know, pure like management consulting role or, or like whatever you want to call it. But um, I think it's just key to make sure that your resume is in line with, uh, you know, what the requirements of the position are. And that sounds obvious, but, um, you know, you might be applying to slightly different roles and, and want to cater accordingly. And uh, again, V can probably speak more to this, but like from what I've heard, there's a lot more like automated reading of resumes now where uh, resumes are being parsed and looking for certain buzzwords. And so, uh, you know, you want to make sure that if a requirement for the role SQL, like you have SQL on your resume um, and that kind of thing. So just make sure that you understand the differences between the expectations of the roles, uh, you know, from what you're coming from and, and where you're going to and that you adapt your resume accordingly. Yeah, so unfortunately right now in the tech industry, it's a little bit more of an employer's market. And so um, when you're doing a transition, and, and ironically, I actually am in the middle of one. Um, so I went to Berkeley and got the software development certificate so I can move from recruiting and be an engineer. Um, but I don't have any experience engineering. And so if I did cold applications, most companies, it's the cliche term, right? Like, well, you need experience before we can hire you. It's like, how do I get experience? So, um, and I know that's a cliche term, especially for college students, but um, in, so instead, I pursued engineering within my own company. My own company is supportive because they know me. I have a relationship with them. So definitely when you're looking to transition in any form of your employment, whether it to be in or out of tech or what have you, um, utilize those relationships that you have because if someone knows you already and trusts you, they're gonna be like, oh cool, I, I really liked working with you. I don't care if it's in product management or engineering, I just wanna work with you. And so um, looking for uh, a transition into a cold application is gonna be even harder than what we're talking about um, earlier about applications than if you utilize those, those relationships. So I, I definitely suggest that. Yeah, I think something we tell students is, you know, highlight like to identify what are the core skills necessary for this new career path that you want and and talk about how you've um either demonstrated those skills or you have the capacity or the aptitude to perform those to perform those skills it's less about the specifics and kind of a little bit more more general there um, yeah. i mean I, I think in the transition uh, it's going to be asked why uh, like why are you, you used to do this other thing are you trying to do this other this new thing um and having a clear answer on that is kind of like a subset of just having a good understanding of like your professional identity as a whole. So what have you done? What has that taught you? Uh, what do you want to do in the future? What skills do you have? How are you going to like succeed in those roles you want? 
Um, and that's something that regardless of this environment or another, regardless of in a transition or not, like you need to have that nailed down because when you get 10 minutes in a room with Nick uh, in like these, in the career center, if you have that crisp, that's only two or three minutes and he's going to remember you and why you want to join Deloitte or Deliver or Shopify. Um, next question, how do you look for project ideas and grow your portfolio uh, if you're a recent grad? So example for data science roles, but I guess that could apply to other, even software engineering. Like how do you, um, if you, again, you just graduated, how do you kind of beef up your resume with um, projects or, or um, I know we talked about um, kind of GitHub too, but any, any other suggestions there? So um, in the terms of data science for this question, I think now is actually a great time for data science roles um, and doing projects on that. There's so much data regarding whether it's COVID, politics, weather, fires in California, things that you can do where they're publishing tons of data that normally would even be private. And it's now going into like government banks. There's a lot of other people pulling data from sensors on GitHub. Um, you do have to be creative. Like, I feel like for a first project, generally just try cloning something, right? If you saw a fire map that you thought was really cool, but you want some other feature, try making that on your own using software like Tableau, using um, React, using different like statistics methods you learned at Cal. And then once you have these clones of existing projects down, that's when I think your brain will just naturally start to get going and you'll be like, what if I had this feature? What if I visualize this? What if I analyze this subset of data? Um, and that's generally the way, whether it's data science or software, I would say is where you go. There's nothing wrong with first cloning a project, like making a clone of Twitter, making a clone of some map visualization. Um, and then you go from there. Yeah, one thing that I'd say is, uh, well, I guess two things. Um, the, the first is that uh, I think it's highly preferential uh, to work on something that you actually find interesting. Um, so you know, don't just, you know, work on the hot topic uh, of the moment just because, you know, they're like, you know, people are interested. Like, I think if you work on something that you find personally interesting, you're going to be more committed to that work. The output's going to be better. Uh, and then, um, you know, you're also, when you're talking about that during an interview, like that passion, that interest is going to be evident. And so it will look like less like resume padding and more like something that someone's doing uh, out of their own interest. So, I mean, with like, you know, Ryan's talking about, I actually think COVID is a good example because, you know, you have this wealth of data and it's brand new. So it's not like other people have been analyzing it for a long time, but there are like so many different angles by which you can view it, right? Uh, you can view it from like an economic lens or a public health lens or, you know, how it's affecting movement in like, you know, between states, whatever it is. Um, so uh, I think that's a, a good one to do. Um, you know, my example was like my, you know, background in econ and while I was on campus, I did uh, research, I was leveraging data from the Central Bank of Costa Rica to optimize like, foreign, direct in, uh, foreign direct investment policy there. And like, I find like the, you know, graph theory application to like, you know, a tangible econ example, like really interesting. And I, I think that helps me, you know, talk about that during an interview, um, you know, with more uh, gumption. And then the other thing is that, um, you know, you, I would try to make sure you have like a little bit of a twist, um, you know, like, especially like from Berkeley resumes, like, you know, the big like core classes that everyone takes, you kind of like see like the same projects that everyone's done in all these um, classes and so if you can either do research or join like a more niche class where you're working on something different that will help you stand out because again like the resume fatigue is a real thing and when you're looking at all these resumes that like seem very similar having something that's just like totally different uh, is something that will stick in the mind of a resume reviewer. Yeah I was going to ask about how you view these personal projects because sometimes you know I've heard students say well you know, well, you know, it was just me. There was no, I had no supervisor. I had no colleague. So I wasn't really building a lot of soft skills. Um, no one was checking my work, you know, so, yeah, it didn't, and there's no, there's no real like result. There's no product. So um, are personal product uh, projects still like valuable? Do they still carry weight on a resume or is it, or should we just put it there if you've got nothing else? 
So in the terms of software, an ideal resume to me would have, um, let's say you're coming into a full-time role, you would have at least one internship and you would have three projects. Um, and when I say three projects, I mean either a website I can demo it on or a GitHub link that I can like click and explore your code, see if you actually did a project. Um, and I'll ask you about it. So like a common thing is even if people list projects, um, once you poke them about it, sometimes they actually can't explain their project. Um, and that's an immediate bad sign. And if I can get that they're passionate about the project, they did indeed work on it, then I'll start asking them, you know, given you worked on this alone, did you still use some type of version control software like Git? And sometimes they'll say, no, I chose to not do it. Other times I'll be like, yeah, I pushed my thing. I asked for changes. I reviewed it myself. I did the whole formal process just alone. Um, and those are actually things that I really, I really value because it shows that people are trying to replicate as much of the kind of classic job or internship experience as they can, even when they're working on something, you know, alone, they, they're going from the end to end. They hypothesize it, test it, play around with a prototype, iterate off of that. Um, they review their own work and that's really valuable to me. Uh, don't put projects on your resume you're not prepared to spend a lot of time getting in the details about. Um, so if you were a part of a five person team on a project, don't, I wouldn't put too much about the parts of the project you didn't spend a lot of time on because any recruiter will expect to be able to basically pick any line on your resume and spend five, 10 minutes on it, asking you about like what exactly you were doing and the exact mechanics of like how you made an impact. Um, so I think especially being a part of maybe a bigger project, it might be time to kind of talk very high level about it because maybe it's a little sexier talking about the big top line impact, but what did you actually do and what are you going to be able to speak to about the project is going to be more important and more valuable for the uh, application uh, for like that part of the interview process. Yeah, to take that one step more, just like how it's going to help how it would help you in this new role, you know, like the skills that you build and how they, you know, you always have to explicitly connect it to something from the job description, like a responsibility or a requirement that it's going to help you to, to achieve. Yeah. I, that's actually a general tip I give for behavioral interviews is um, treating why you should hire me as like the thesis statement of your behavioral interview. Um, I learned this while practicing behavioral interviews with people. Uh, I did it with a guy who was just so killer at doing this. Um, and I didn't realize it was something I was missing in my toolkit um, until I saw someone else doing it really well. So that's also another way getting your reps in on uh, interviewing uh, can help you get better because you'll see other people do things and learn what they are doing better than you. I'm not sure if this is helpful in the realm of tech, but just from a consulting side too, if you're applying for roles in consulting firms, that are related to tech. I know that a lot of the recruiters have told me they know that they're gonna have to do so much training with you that in our end of it, sometimes also what's the most important thing is to um, really heavily show an interest in that particular subject you're trying to join in and why. At least on my end, I went into cyber with a stats background, no CS, no cyber, but I had a very clear reason why I thought I would be an interesting fit and why I would be passionate about it. And I remember hearing that sometimes cover letters can be hit or miss, but I still made sure to fully emphasize why I wanted it in the cover letter. And during my first interview, that recruiter actually had the cover letter printed out and wanted to talk about it. So I think that if, even if you don't, can't get a ton of experience that might be obviously relevant to a job you're applying, I think that just means you need to more tailor your resume and your cover letter and really show why it's still a good fit and why you'd be a very motivated candidate. I was going to ask a little bit about the behavioral uh, interview, um, kind of dig in there. I'm sure in some form you've either, you know, taken part as an applicant or maybe as a, as a part of, as an interviewer, um, and how to navigate the behavioral. We did do a session yesterday with students on that, but um, we'd love to just kind of hear your stories about um, some of those traps in the behavioral interview and like how to answer sometimes the, the questions like, tell me about yourself, which should be the easiest question in the world, but sometimes can actually be the most difficult to, to, to answer. So any like either personal stories or tips that you might give for navigating those interviews? My thing here, I'll, I'll 
just say quickly, it comes back to that thing I said earlier. You need to have your own professional identity defined, which is can be your, or at least part of your um, tell me about yourself thing. Um, like if you don't know why you want a job, you're not gonna convince anyone else why you want that job. Um, and that I think can be tricky, especially when there's that thought of, I just want a job and you're applying to lots of different things. And it can be scary to kind of like narrow through focus and determine like what you actually kind of want more than other things. Um, but it's just not gonna work out for anyone involved if you get into a role, if you get into a job in a disingenuous way, because you're not gonna last there very long and it's gonna be a waste of their time and you're not gonna enjoy the role as well. So just spending that time to know what you're looking for out of your next role and what you want out of your professional life uh, is really going to help you answer that question and also help you really succeed throughout the whole behavioral interview because you can always kind of come back to that identity as you work through it. I also think that, you know, with behavioral interviews, um, you know, strictly speaking, there might be a wide variety of questions, but, you know, they're not that discreet. And so like, for instance, what I did when I was applying full time is I, I mean, I just, you know, thought about it and like literally used Google to compile what I thought might be 20, 25 behavioral uh, questions that I'd be asked and was like drafting out my responses to those. Um, you know, I don't like, I think you'll be a lot more confident if you're going into an interview and the standard questions, you know, what's, what was your greatest accomplishment? Tell me about a project that you led. Um, you know, what's your greatest weakness? Like, you don't want to walk into that question. Be like, uh, I, I work too hard, right? Like you, you want to make sure that you've thought that out. Um, and so, uh, that's what I did is I, you know, had those, uh, you know, typed out and, and thought about them. And, and actually you, you have an advantage in a virtual setting where, you know, it'd be easy to have a piece of paper or, uh, like a Google doc or whatever, where, uh, you can have, you know, some, some information up there. You know, like I said before, you know, don't look to your second screen and read something verbatim, you know, maybe have a few bullet points there to, to jog your memory. Um, but that's what I found helpful. And then also just having, you know, you don't have to have, you know, 25 different answers yourself. You know, you might have a few different examples that you can use to, uh, you can leverage to answer different behavioral questions. So like I would use my experience as a project leader for uh, a consulting team uh, at TVG for many different uh, responses and just like adapt them uh, based on the specific question. I'll tack onto that. I had the same kind of like 15, 20 question list. Um, but I would go through, I like a template and then I'd save a different copy every interview I was going into. And I, my answers for 10 of the 15 might be very, very different or five of the 15 might be very, very different. And then the other 10, it's kind of picking which is the best example for this question, for this role. So continuing to kind of build on that, making it bespoke, trying to stand out, trying to be specific to that role. Make sure that you have really good time management skills. It's uh, very common and easy to fall into uh, being a little over eager in an interview and trying to get every single detail into it and telling your life story because then they'll, they'll want to hire me if they know everything or if I make sure not to forget any detail. Where in reality, interviewers have, what, five, six questions that they're assigned probably, and they need to get through all of them in order to get a holistic view of you. So make sure you practice being really concise. Be detailed. Do not tell your life story because people will start to lose interest and their mind will wander. And, and you want to make sure to, to display a, a really good example of yourself. So it is very common. It's, it, it happens all the time. But with, you know, as Justin's saying, with practicing, um, make sure you get into a very nice, tight answer for each of those questions as well. I think a good way to close out your interview too is they're always going to ask if you have any questions. All four of my interviewers did it. Um, and I think it's hard to say, maybe some people don't read into this, but I've definitely heard interviewers say that if the candidate immediately says they don't have any questions or they kind of sit there for a little bit, um, it might seem a little disinterested compared to that candidate who has like two or three questions where they're really curious and excited to hear what that person has to say. So 
I would definitely try to think of some things that you want to know more about the job or that person in particular if you see more about their role on like LinkedIn ahead of time or based on something they say in the interview because it'll definitely be a good way to show that you're interested in the role. The question one's kind of interesting. I think uh, I, I interviewed for consulting out of college. Um, I gave the time back to the interviewer relatively often. Uh, that's because if I had any questions about the company, I feel like I should have had those answered already by the time I was talking to anyone in person. Uh, so if I would ask questions, it would just be about something they had kind of told me in like the intro or the background. Uh, in fact, I'd have interviews run over because we'd end up getting into someone's like project experience. Um, now, in the role I'm currently taking interviews for, uh, it's for like my current role. Um, and so if someone doesn't ask me questions about the role and I'm the only other person for this role they're talking to, then they're not getting all the information they want and then it's like a bad sign. So uh, the questions I think can be reflective of um, you trying to figure out your fit in the role, which is something we wanna see when we're recruiting because it shows a genuine interest in someone who might be there for a while versus for a little bit and just trying to get a job. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely don't, don't do the thing where like you have like your stock question that you ask every single interviewer. Um, and also like, don't be uninterested if there is something that you're interested in. Yeah. I think of the cliche questions like, you know, you know, what does a day look like here? And you know, what's the culture of this team? I think they're, 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 they're very general and cliched. And, you know, so I definitely tell students to kind of steer away from those, find something you know, ask a question that only the person in front of you can answer. You can't get the answer like on the web or like, you know, glass door or something like that. Um, Brian, there was a question that was kind of aimed towards you and your background in AR or VR. One of you just want to quickly give us an answer there. Like um, it says, uh, what sort of internship, internships or companies do you think are most relevant in the AR or VR field? Uh, what ways do you think someone can start out in AR or VR as a freshman? My question is, what is AR or VR? Sure, so AR, VR um, is augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, okay. um, it's also become known as extended reality or mixed reality. So plugging my old club, it's now called extended reality at Berkeley. Um, I basically grew it into what it is. It will, even as a freshman, there are opportunities for you there. They teach a decal, you can join the decal. You don't have to know basically anything beyond basic CS 61A. We bought laptops, we bought headsets, we give you the equipment. We take you from knowing very little code into VR development um, through projects. And then there's basically a cycle where people who are the decal can join the club, work on projects in the club. Projects in the club that gain attention are showcased to people in industry and professors who in turn will then try to pick you up from there. So we have like a whole ecosystem going for VR because it's such an, a niche field, it's really hard to break into. Um, so in terms of internships or companies, this is rough because uh, generally AR or VR does need more background. You need to be a software engineer and know some neuro and perception and other like sciencey fields. Um, so of course, Facebook Reality Labs is the dominant player. They basically monopolize the industry. Um, Apple is trying to take a slice of that in the augmented reality field um, and almost every other company got killed out. So I would say if you're looking for something that is a big name, Facebook Reality Labs is on a huge hiring surge right now. If you don't want to do that, Skydeck um, has a lot of startups every year that are focused on some form of AR, VR. Um, and of course, it's, it's going to grow in the field because as we're entering COVID, as we're entering everything remote, you know, Zoom itself is doing amazing, remote conferencing software, anything remote's doing well. So VR will naturally grow with that. Um, the bigger thing uh, to look for in that field is beyond the classic uses. So um, a big thing that Apple is concerned about is ad manipulation in AR, VR. If you wear augmented reality glasses, they can overwrite ads in the real world. So if you're interested in security, how do you ensure that ads delivered correctly? If you're interested in marketing, you know, how do you optimize those? Um, there's different use cases that are now branching out beyond just like the standard use. And I think that's where the industry is gonna go in the general direction. Um, Brian, what you said earlier was a good segue into another question I wanted to ask about, and this is for the whole panel. What did you do when you were a student uh, at Cal or, or at Berkeley Extension? What kind of steps did you take or what resources did you take advantage of while you were a student that you felt or feel helped you transition 
either into an internship or into like their first time that that um that uh, full-time role after you graduated um yeah i'll start on this one too so the big thing is there's this kind of like standard application cycle. I feel like you start the semester, you have to start applying to internships. It's just like big rush. Um, so take the summer to figure out, narrow it down a bit. Don't just apply to 300 companies and, and spend all your energy there. First, try to narrow it down a little bit. Um, craft, as a student even, what your kind of like identity is, professional identity is, and then go from there. Um, and the big thing is, I will say like cold emailing uh, professors, cold emailing students, trying to explore all of the clubs on campus is a rough but like essential first step. Um, because if you are just taking classes, that's, that's gonna be impossible to get an internship. You have to have some type of personal connection or professional connection to a club, a professor, um, someone in more of a subset of a field that can get uh, your foot in the door. So in my case, what I did was, um, I did try to take as many classes focused on AR, VR, I met other people that were interested in the equipment. And eventually I ended up just by chance connecting to someone who happened to work at Bell Labs. And this was in March, so way past the standard application cycle. I thought I was, you know, I'm not getting an internship, but I decided to keep networking, keep chatting. And then he was like, hey, we're, we kind of started recruiting, like, but do you want to join? Um, and it was like the simplest interview process at a well-known research place. Um, and it was just a matter of, of talking to people and actually trying to grow that, that professional identity in this field. I think this boils down to two things. There's like one, the professional side of things, and then two, the skill side of things. So uh, I'll keep harping on this, but, you know, joining any sort of club, um, you know, it, it, it's not quite as important exactly which club it is, but just joining an organization where you're going to be uh, you know, having responsibilities or leading a team or something that will be replicative of what you do in the real world. I think you know, as a resume reviewer, that assuages a lot of concerns for me that this person has operated in a manner, you know, at least somewhat similar as, or as similar as possible as could be for a student um, you know, before coming here. Uh, part of that, obviously, too, is you know, internships. Uh, so that's one side of things. And then two uh you know skills so uh i think like especially at a school like berkeley where it's very like academia focused uh, you have a lot of students that will uh, go into graduate studies get phds that kind of thing it's a lot of theory right um and so oftentimes like if a major is catered towards that it might not have as many components that are geared towards like the pre-professional side of things and so i think you have to take a step back and say okay what am I missing, right? What else do I need? And so a good way to do that, if you're a you know, freshman, sophomore, junior, or whatever, uh, just look up the job description for roles that you're interested in and, and see like what they outline. So as an example, for me, like I, I studied economics and public policy, but uh, you know, I ended up taking classes like uh, 61A, Math 53 and 54, uh, Stat 133 was where I learned R, um, all sorts of classes like that because I felt like I needed uh, you know, to supplement my uh, background with a few specific skills that would be useful for the positions that I'm interested in. So uh, just make sure you have a plan of attack there. So, you know, if, if I need to, if I want this job, here are the skills that I'm going to need. And then, you know, put yourself in a position with the clubs and classes that you're taking to acquire said skills. The original question, just checking in here, is um, to succeed on the first job, right? Not just uh, to have the skills going into the first job, like to talk to. No, I, I, it could be that too. Just you know, whether it's the whether it's the skills, or maybe just did you do something that established the network that helped you get the job? So uh, it could be yeah, just to get in the job or being successful in the job. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess my, my advice, I, I have more so on the side of succeeding on the job. Um, and that just, my advice there is, like, go for internships early and go for internships uh, off cycle. I took two semesters off school. I strongly recommend, even if you're not going for the fall or spring cycle, for uh, look for companies that offer that. Uh, because those companies tend to actually put their interns to work versus run like extended interview processes. 
Um, so I did two internships for Disney World for a total of seven months. I did a SpaceX internship for four months and an Accenture internship for three months. So I started my first job with like almost a year and a half of work experience and I was still only like okay at it. Um, so, and that was because where I was starting from was not like a good place necessarily. I went to my first internship for an industrial engineering internship and the IOR program at Berkeley is for you to go get a PhD in IOR. It's not for you to be an industrial engineer day one. So I had to learn Excel. I still had to learn SQL. I had to learn Arena because instead we weren't learning anything about Excel. Our SQL class was about database theory and structure uh, with Vita SQL. And our simulation class was about how to build a simulator versus using like industry standard simulation software. Um, so going out and getting those reps early in the workforce uh, will kind of highlight where your gaps are and really start to get the ball rolling for you to identify those skills. And for me, it identified that I might need a little more time before I kind of go for that uh, kind of first main job. And that ended up probably being helpful for me long term, even if it, you know, had another semester in school before I graduated. So different ways to go about it. Yeah, and then just quick follow up there. Um, you know, I know we've mentioned like, you know, Berkeley being, you know, very academia oriented and whatnot. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, you know, you, I think it's like really incredible opportunity to be taking classes and working on projects with people that are not just in their fields, but are going to further their respective fields. Um, you know, so don't feel like you're behind or anything like that. You know, you're amongst some of the greatest minds in the world in your fields, but just recognize that, you know, if that is what programs are often designed for, um, you know, you need to say, okay, if that's not what I'm going for, how should I adjust, you know, my schedule and the things that I'm doing accordingly? And it can be a strength. So like I wasn't able to do an arena simulation on my first internship because I didn't have that background. But at a later internship, I was able to build a simulator from scratch because that was what we were taught in our classic Cal. So you may have a little bit of that initial learning curve to go, but a lot of base stuff will actually potentially be higher than people in other programs. Don't forget your classmates either. Uh, I have been introduced to several opportunities through just talking to my classmates um, in Berkeley classes. And one silver lining about the pandemic is that it's not going to just force you to go to this coffee that maybe you're really uncomfortable with because you're an introvert or maybe English isn't your first language. And so it's really daunting for you. Um, instead, utilize different technologies in order to connect with your classmates. You can use Slack, you can use email, you can use your class discussion board. And so find what works for you to be able to put yourself out there, which can be scary sometimes, to just start introducing yourself to different classmates and different TAs um, to get that network going from the beginning. Nick, things you did while at, while at Cal to kind of help prepare you for that transition? Nick, that question's for you. Sorry, did, just to repeat it, it was things that I did at Cal to help prepare me for the transition? Yep. Um, probably not the best answer or that people are looking for, but actually I transferred to Cal as a junior. Um, I worked in the computer lab. I did um, some help with one of the classes, STAT 133, if anyone's taken it. Um, so I tried to engage with people as much as possible and, and do anything I could outside of it, but I actually didn't do any consulting groups. So for me, as far as what I did to transition, um, I know that when I found out what I was working, I made sure that my last semester I was thinking of ways that I could get ready, which in my case was starting to look at a lot of cyber materials for some of the certifications I'd be considering. Um, besides that, I can't really talk to anything about at Cal specifically. I do think there's some value in looking into that ahead of time, though, because a lot of jobs have certifications that you can do or might want to do once you're there, and that can help get ahead a little bit. Um, another question in the Q&A, any advice for applying for full-time roles when you're not sure which specific area of, compu of computer science you want to get into yet? I know I see a lot of students who kind of and they're not sure what they want to do. And a lot of times it's just validating that and normalizing it and saying that it's okay. But if somebody is looking to really narrow down what they want to do, what advice do you have for them? 
Um, so I'll talk on this kind of in two directions, actually. There's the first of most people will not know what they want to do, but they know they want to specialize in something eventually. The other side, which I did, was uh, I kind of pigeonholed myself into VR and that I actually wanted to do something different professionally. Um, so in the first direction, that's easier. Um, if you're not sure what you want to do in CS yet, the good fact is you're a student and companies are aware of this. Um, Google, Facebook, every big company has programs, especially if you're a freshman or sophomore or junior transfer, where you join a generalized kind of mentoring and engineering program. Um, there'll be like 10 to 12 week internships. You have a lot more mentoring though. And then that will kind of guide, you saw this team, you met with this team, which is starting to feel like a better fit for you. And the goal of those programs is that they can then rehire you the next year as an intern for a more specific role and get you contributing more to the company. Um, and if you're, you know, junior, senior, and you're still not sure what you want to do, that's also fine. Um, I feel like that, uh, you know, one of the good ways to transition is within a company. So let's say you join some major company, you join in a generalized like full stack engineering role, and then you start being like, I like security then just start within the company doing some side projects on security, some 20% things. Um, start talking to people on that team. Maybe you can eventually get in there. Um, I'm gonna just like talk a little bit about the pigeonhole side then, which is let's say you do a ton of research at Cal in one specific subset and you're about to go get a PhD in it and you realize I don't wanna do this. Um, that's the other flip side, which I encountered. Luckily, the thing is you have by then generally experience, you have mastery of some specific subject and it's a matter of talking to the recruiters as to why you want to get out of it. Um, and that's more of a soft skill thing where you say that you've explored this option, you realize it's not the right fit for you, but you have these skills that will transfer into this new role. You have this work ethic, you have a habit of delivering on measured results. And, and that's something that you do then once you graduate. Um, but in terms of, you know, if you're not sure what you want to do yet when you're a student, I think that's one of the most common things and don't worry about that too much. Yeah, I, I kind of want to talk to this because you know we brought up this idea of like professional identity and narrowing your focus. Uh, I don't, I don't mean that to suggest at all. You need to have a very specific idea of like what you want to go do. Um, so like my professional identity coming into Cal, going into my first role was just like I'm a quanti problem solver. Like I just like figuring stuff out. So I did generally engineering, wasn't quite sure. Then IOR because it seemed even pretty still more flexibly um, applicable. And that worked when I was going into consulting uh, because you move around and do lots of different things. Uh, but that also worked when I was talking to SpaceX or to Disney. My SpaceX internship was for a supply chain role. And I told him like, look, I'm not that obsessed with supply chain. It's one really interesting thing to me because it's a really complex problem. And I really like figuring out complex problems. And that manager, call, when he called me back the next day to offer me the role, was like, great, I don't want a supply chain expert because there's so much unknown stuff that we need you to work on. We need a more flexible person who's just going to be trying to figure stuff out. So that was an instance of me being honest about like what I wanted for in a role and it lining up with what the company was looking for. And it resulted in a really good experience. And it was a broad thing, still kind of broad thing, especially in terms of industry or focus uh, that I was looking for at that time. And to echo what the rest of the panelists said earlier, uh, it's okay that you don't, if you don't know exactly what area, but genuine interest in the company is really important. So don't know if you wanna be say a front end or back end engineer, just for example. Maybe you know what industry you're interested in. Are you interested in finance and banking? Are you interested in space? Are you interested in autonomous vehicles? I think that will get you at least interested in and also um, engaged enough for you to be able to talk really well and enthusiastically in order to get a job. And then once you're in there, you'll have the experience where you're working on a team and, and it, you'll be able to have, you know, different experiences or projects to help kind of narrow down that focus. So for me, for example, um, as I started taking classes at Berkeley, I really didn't like building websites like at all. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to be a front end engineer. Cool. So I've checked one of those off the list. And so I got down to it and I found that I realized on the weekends, all of the projects I did were embedded systems. It was all IOT stuff. And I would be buying Arduino online and building stuff out. And so 
from there, I, I was able to discover just through my own habits and my, my own projects uh, that, okay, I really want to be an embedded systems engineer. I started following a ton of companies on LinkedIn and Glassdoor, like space companies, satellite companies, um, you know, different companies that, that I was really engaged with. I'm like, okay, so this is the type of role I want to do. And so through that exploration and just starting with maybe just a seed of interest can really help you narrow down that path. Yeah, and then one more thing to add there. So obviously I can't speak to the uh, CS angle specifically, fortunately, and Brian for that. But um, as far as like understanding what exact type of full-time role you want, um, like when I was leaving you know, my consulting role after the first few years out of school and looking for the next thing, uh, I actually I like wasn't really sure. I was I knew I wanted to do something at the nexus of data and strategy, but I probably spent months like I've got like dozens of pages on Evernote of like brainstorming, you know, what I wanted to do, and you know I don't think it's bad. I think I think it's good to like you know sit there and think about okay, you know what is it that I want to do? But actually, what made that more concrete to me was literally getting into these interviews and articulating to recruiters like what I was looking for, what I was interested in. So. Uh, by that, I mean, you know, there's a balance. You want to do some prep and some thinking about the types of roles that you want, what, what you're interested in. Um, but also, you know, a big way to kind of understand both what you're looking uh, for is like being forced to articulate that along with uh, having a better sense from like recruiters or people that are in the roles that you're interested in, uh, having a better sense of like what exactly it is that, that they do. So, um, you know, maybe don't, uh, hop right into your first interview with your top choice, right? Um, you know, I think you can pick some companies that you're kind of interested in, even if it doesn't work out. It's not like a total failure, like right? you're still learning and experiencing the interview process. But, um, you know, you go through that, you have a clear idea personally what you're interested in, um, you know, and then you can speak to it with more conviction. Um, Justin, I want to kind of ask, look, you, know, you kind of inspired a question there. I was thinking about the soft skills you mentioned, like uh, you know, flexibility. To the panel, what when we work with students, when we see a lot of technical resumes. They're like they're up to the eyeballs in technical skills um, and programs and applications. And sometimes they're a little light on the soft skills. Not so much that they don't have them, but that they, in terms of how they talk about them. From your experience, what are the top soft skills to highlight in a resume or a cover letter or, or an interview? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't actually recall exactly what I said around soft skills earlier, um, but I can try and kind of speak to that now a little. Uh, I'd say one thing that really will jump out um, both Actually, you know, I haven't hired for a software engineer role, but um, every role I've ever hired for when you get, and, and I've been a part of primarily hiring more technical talent. So when I was a part of uh, looking at applications and consulting was for like data science consulting, uh, Deliver, we're looking for very like able to go fully own your analysis type people. Um, that resume, like we wanna see the demonstration of that technical ability. And kind of one of the red flags that will pop is if it doesn't necessarily show your ability to work well with other people. Uh, that is kind of one of the things that uh, can really limit your ability to make an impact. So you can put your head down and do really, really good work, but you can put your head down, pick it up every now and then and pull someone in and be twice or three times as efficient. Uh, that I don't know about highlighting on the resume. I guess if you're talking about project work, it speaks to it a little. Uh, that, at least in my experience, has been something we kind of uh, think about a little bit more in the interview process. Um, so we'll like have a note for certain candidates on like kind of what you're trying to validate uh, as you go through the interview process. And um, yeah, thinking about that process of actually being in the team room with them and working through things with them is really, really important to get the sense of. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't... I haven't as much tried to look for that on the resume. That is something more so that I've considered during the uh, interview process. Just my experience though, uh, a lot of other people here. Yeah, there's any soft skills you think um, are important to convey? 
Curiosity and self-awareness. You want to be a curious person because of the fact that you are in the beginning of your career and you want to learn. If you want to learn, people are eager to teach you, especially in an internship. If you are self-aware, you are accepting feedback. You are admitting your mistakes. You are able to ask questions without you know, feeling guilty about it. Um, the number one reason someone doesn't work out in the first six months of employment is because they don't take feedback well. It's okay to get things wrong. It's okay to admit failure. It's okay to apologize for something. Um, but if you are self-aware, you are a better team member. You are a better teammate. Uh, people want to work with you more. Um, and that self-awareness does in fact extend to the resume, not just interviewing and your job. Um, and by that, I mean resumes that are really verbose and very, very dense don't often uh, get a lot of positive feedback. Uh, an average recruiter, I think the average is 30 seconds to review a resume, if that. Um, so you want to make sure and be kind of ruthless with what uh, you're putting on your resume and taking off your resume. Um, make sure it's the really meaty, important stuff and not, like I said earlier with interviewing, not your whole life story. It's just, to, the resumes just get you in the door. And so what in that resume is going to catch someone's eye it's going to look nice and clean. It's going to be pleasant to the eye and really get them interested in talking to you. Um, so those are the, the two soft skills that I would say. Yeah, uh, related to what Justin was talking about where, you know, there's a lot of detecting of soft skills in the interview. Um, I think especially with the uh, you know virtual interview process, it's a lot harder to establish rapport. Like you're not walking into a conference room and shaking someone's hand and chatting about your weekend per se. But like the interviews that I've done remotely that have I've felt have gone well from the soft skill side of things. Um, you know, I've had candidates who like you know crack a joke or two, right? I mean, don't make your interview a comedy routine, but um, you know if you uh, you know can share some humor or uh, you know, be more personable. Um, you know, a lot of people, especially if they're like the hiring manager is hiring for someone on their team, you know, they want someone who can, you know, execute the job they have. Um, but they also want someone who they're going to enjoy working with. So, um, you know, it's not as simple as like a black and uh, black and white, you know, what are your skills, right? It's also, um, you know, am I going to enjoy working with this person? Will they succeed, um, you know, in this, in this role? Uh, question in the Q&A, uh, are there any certificates or online courses that you found are valuable with skill building or, or just in general good to know in tech? I'll answer just as like a real subset of kind of what we were talking about earlier. If you're applying to a job that is explicitly says like we want R or P Python or SQL, if you haven't worked with that before, if you haven't taken a class about that, uh, is there an online course you can take to have that somewhere on your resume? Um, so our role is, you know, we've been hiring for a biz ops associate uh, and we really, really want someone with SQL. And we've talked to a few people without that on their, in their background and, you know, kind of gauge their ability to learn, kind of try to take stock of their level of interest. But uh, I think one or two of the candidates we talked to had gone and just done some SQL training before applying or before their technical parts, their SQL uh, interview. And that 100% demonstrated their willingness and ability to learn because they went out and you can do, you can get basic SQL for at least in a day. Um, you can get the ability to demonstrate your willingness to learn a new skill uh, very quickly, even if you're not going to have that mastery. Um, so this doesn't apply if it's like a software engineer role, it's gonna be in Python, you're not gonna get anything on the weekend, that's gonna help there. Um, but there are roles that things are nice to have or we expect you to grow and develop into that actually going out and getting some of that training on your own, at least to a small extent, shows your willingness to grow in that direction. Yeah, this was actually my experience exactly when I applied to deliver the uh, job description said- you And we hired him. <laughs> yeah, we haven't looked back since. Um, and, uh, you know, because I, the job description said you need to be comfortable with using, you know, SQL every day. And I spend, you know, multiple hours every day writing SQL. Uh, I had very minimal of any SQL background. I was like more in R and Python. So 
yeah, two points here. Um, you know, one, uh, you know, don't, don't make, make sure you don't have imposter syndrome. Like, I think it's really easy to look at all these, like, oh, these people are so talented or, or whatever. Like, you know, nobody's that special really. Um, and, you know, based on the, you know, the school you're at and the majors that you're in, you know, you're amongst uh, some of the smartest people out there. And so, you know, I, you know, I, I remember myself looking through all these job descriptions and, you know, they just have so many requirements and there are very few where you felt like you checked literally every box, but I think you should feel fine with applying, you know, if you, you know, check most of the boxes and are a little bit short on some things. Obviously, if you're a nuclear engineer, don't apply to a job to build bridges or whatever, but, um, you know, use your judgment, right? Um, and so, you know, I was able, I applied for the role uh, literally was on like, uh, you know, code Academy or whatever, just to like learn the fundamentals. And then in my interview, um, you know, I was, uh, the guy who's my manager now, uh, was giving me that question. And I was like, well, I'm not as proficient in SQL. If I was in, you know, R, I would use like, you know, if statement, right. And he's like, well, in SQL, there was a case one. And so then I would like, was able to apply that, uh, during the interview itself. So, yeah, I think, uh, as far as like the, online courses and stuff. If you feel like the gap between being, you know, what you have and being qualified for the role is pretty small, uh, then yeah, I would see what you can learn online and then just be prepared during the interview to say, you know, hey, I've got a background in this, which I think is applicable. I've done a bit of learning on my own and, you know, I can demonstrate I've learned this much quickly and can quickly, you know, have everything under my belt necessary for this role. Nick, any um, <clears throat> certificates or courses in the in the like security world that um, are kind of current or trending? Nick, that question's for you. Yeah, um, I think starting out, I mean, there's some basic ones like Security Plus you can get, and then they have a lot of ones that are tailored. Like there's one for Linux. I know that a lot of the engineers I've worked with have. Um, the golden one, which is the SISB that a lot of people talk about, you actually get a few years in, it requires some work experience. So I think when you're first starting out in cybersecurity, especially the best thing you can do is look at the material to familiarize yourself, but especially going into something like consulting, unless you know, you really want to do something specific in the cyber realm, it might be hard to know what certifications you want to do initially. Um, Security Plus, I'd say, is the broadest one that I'm aware of, where it could be very generalized for anyone who wants to just get some knowledge and foundation. And just to plug, um, Cal students have access to LinkedIn Learning. Um, so they can, it's a subscription-based online learning platform. It used to be called lynda.com, I'm sure many of you know, but, um, you know, they have great courses on there, everything from technical courses to, you know, learning R, Python, even I think cybersecurity to the soft skills we talked about, if you want to learn how to, you know, speak with confidence or be a better manager or, um, you know, um, you know, time management, they have courses on LinkedIn learning. So, you know, encourage students to, to access that subscription because it's, uh, it's pretty valuable. Um, okay. So we're going to start to wrap up. I wanted to just kind of throw it out there to the panel to see if there's any kind of last thoughts that you may you want to either tack on to a question we asked earlier, or if there's any like kind of closing closing advice that you would give to uh, students as they enter this recruiting season, which as we know, it's, it's kind of in hyperdrive now, but it does really extend throughout the year. So any kind of like, like final remarks you can pass on. Maybe let's go, I'll go in a circle again. Uh, Nick, let's go with you and then we'll go around to Connor, Brian, Justin, and then B. Um, I guess it's kind of cliche, but um, we've all heard this, but I think, that just as much as they're interviewing you to see if you're right for the role, when you're going to all these networking fairs and you're talking to all the different professionals from different companies, different industries, in a way you're also interviewing them. I mean, you're at Cal, everyone here is qualified to be applying for these jobs. And at some point you have to figure out what career you wanna do. So rather than think about it, like you're applying for all of these companies that are prestigious and maybe it seems a little daunting trying to get a job at them, at the same time, they're looking for candidates just like you. So I would just focus on figuring out where the best fit is. And then once you identify it, just go all in for those companies that you think fit you the best. Thanks, Nick. Connor? Yeah, a few things. Uh, one, it's, it's a very large undertaking. So I think being efficient is important. 
you know, for me, for instance, I uh, was applying primarily through LinkedIn, Glassdoor, and then AngelList more on the startup side. So a few things you can do, uh, you know, one on, I think, I think actually on all those websites, you can like set yourself as like actively searching. That's not a replacement for uh, being proactive yourself. Uh, but it can help that you can field inbound requests uh, like for deliver, for instance, like that's how I got connected with Lana or recruiter. Um, and, you know, and then I was like, making sure like, I saved all the filters. Like I'm looking for, you know, a role in this. Uh, I mean, I guess geographic location is not quite as uh, relevant now, but you know, this, uh, this location, these job titles, this size of company, et cetera. And I was like, you know, saving those filters so I could go quick, go through all these options quickly and identify the roles that I was interested in. Um, and then uh, I, I'd also say like, uh, don't forget to uh, prioritize. Uh, I think at Berkeley with the you know, academics being so demanding, it's easy to say like, oh, I've got this, you know, midterm or this project I need to work on. Like at the end of the day, your goal now, uh, especially if you're a senior and applying for full-time roles is to get hired. Like you're senior year grades aren't really going to matter that much. So, so just make sure that you are understanding, okay, my, my uh, objective is to get this job and that you're prioritizing. Like I, you know, treated it as like a class or multiple classes essentially where I would block out time every day where I'd be, uh, you know, working on applying or interviewing that kind of stuff. So just make sure, making sure you're treating it with the, uh, you know, heightened priority that it has. Right. Brian? Yeah, I'll just echo that last statement. Make sure that you balance everything. There's the diminishing returns to studying all day, to applying to jobs all day, et cetera. Um, and definitely try to go for that quanti uh, quality first. So like you can apply to 300 companies and spend all your energy there, but making sure that you really do um, tailor your resume to every role you apply to, write a cover letter if needed, um, meet, know someone at the company, just so that when you do apply, you want to be passing the phone screen. You want to be getting into technical interview. You want to be leaving good impressions. Um, and then this is just kind of a random tangent, but if you've ever tried to grow house plants and they all die on you, um, the frustration there, do something else that gets you frustrated until you go back to, you know, studying, do something else, take a break. And then eventually be like, you know, I do want to start applying the jobs again. I do want to study again and make sure that you're motivated intrinsically to do these things. Right. Justin. Uh, small point, if you are a freshman or sophomore, I guess most people knew this. I actually, I didn't, I'm a first generation American college student. Um, the GPA, having a good GPA does help get in the room, especially on the cold application process. So if you have the ability to still influence that, try and influence it positively. Um, and then I, I'll come kind of back to Nick's point on the kind of alignment everyone's looking for. Like there's no way you trick yourself into like a happy sustainable like job um i like to use the metaphor of like the happy marriage algorithm so it's like everyone gets if if we had all perfect information and everyone had their ranked lists you know we could get a non crazy runtime best solution uh for getting everyone to their jobs that's not quite how it works because you don't have all that information together but that is still how you're gonna get the best outcomes is just you knowing what you want and being honest about who you are and what you want and then the role can correctly make decisions. Um, and then to kind of younger students especially uh, who don't really have much experience either on the project side or still starting to take your first few classes, how do you start to understand what you might wanna do? Uh, I, and this exercise works as you get uh, older as well. Just like spend the time, think about it, like understand what the role entails, think about spending your day that way so connor has always been like a pretty academic like really wants to crack these complex problems type of guy so when he's going through his hundreds of lines of sql code on this like really complex uh problem he's solving like i know he's thrilled and like having a good time um and if you're thinking about that you're thinking about yourself sitting there and like scratching your head and trying to crack this nut like and you're not happy about thinking of yourself in that role, then that might not be a role for you. And you know, what other roles can you think of that you would be enjoying what you're doing? Um, and that will help you then uh, communicate that to other people once you can get that understanding. Do you wanna close this out? Sure, so uh, two pieces actually. Um, 
our industry is not just the big five or six companies that are always in the news. Look at the, uh, you know, the subject matter industry inside of tech that you're really interested in, or the leaders in tech or founders in tech that, that would really interest you. Um, you know, Connor mentioned AngelList. There are a ton of smaller startups who are still very much interested in growing their teams and hiring and maybe aren't getting as many applications as say Facebook and Amazon. And so there's an opportunity there to really get in. And, and a lot of times there's more opportunity for mentorship at these smaller companies as well. So it's great for new grads. Uh, and then the second piece is uh, similar to uh, what Justin said about marriage. Um, recruiting is not an exact science. Interviewing is not an exact science and it's very subjective. So don't take it overly personally if it doesn't work out because it's like dating. You both might be good people, maybe just not good for each other. And so it's important to ask for feedback and, and obviously take that feedback to heart, but don't ever um, get into like a, a self-loathing cycle just because a company didn't see a match because it's, it's not necessarily about you, it's about what they're looking for. And so keep persevering and pushing through and you'll find success advice across the spectrum i really i really appreciate that i just want to say thanks again to all of you for lending your time and your expertise really valuable um it's so great to get you know to hear your experiences and hopefully students like who who, who set in can kind of take away some nuggets and then then apply it as we go so for students we have one more uh session after this at uh, 2 15 it's a uh, it's um job search tips for international students so really encourage you to to join that um that discussion um if it applies to you but to our panelists thanks again i really appreciate your time and uh, have a good weekend yeah thank you mike and Reve. this was a good time and your background of uh the bay from the berkeley hills is making me nostalgic <laughs> all right thanks everyone bye thank you yeah very good one